So friends, now we come to the, the core part of the session this evening, uh, an interview, uh, an interactive session with uh, advocate Sai Deepak. Sai Deepak is an engineer who turned into an advocate subsequently, and he's been involved in some of the landmark cases in the country. As a student, his blog post on the patent dispute between Bajaj and TBS is something that was quoted extensively and was included as part of a judgment delivered by the Madras High Court. There are a lot of other cases such as the cases, the case between Greenpeace and TV, uh, Tata Sons is something that he was involved in and he also represented the Basmati rice cultivators um, in, a, in a dispute that involved them as well. And in 2018, his defense of Lord Ayappa's right to celibacy is something that was very well appreciated and well mentioned in media across the country. And since then, Sai has been, like Swamiji said, passionately involved in promoting the idea of Indic awareness um, and through his nuanced arguments has been distilling some of the complex issues that governs some of the legal aspects that are confronting the country today. So it's indeed a pleasure having you Sai on the program. Thank you. You've actually spoken about the need for a common perception of history and we are actually living in a time where even a common perception of current events seems to be a little challenging to you know attain. So in a nation as diverse as say India, you know, when we try to attempt to have a common perception of history, right, you would invariably find one section being blamed and one section taking the position of a, of a victim. Um, unlike, uh, you know, a homogeneous characterization, the way it happened in say Germany, where they took on the blame or say China, where they, you know, they took the position of being a victim by Japanese aggression. So how do you see this whole idea of a common perception of history getting developed in a country like India without it, you know, creating divisions? So I think it's a it's an extremely pertinent question. And given that I consider myself a learner when it comes to some of these issues, I will keep my answer tentative. Okay. And therefore, there's a decent chance that my answer perhaps reflects my understanding at the current moment. It may change in the future. And this is the, let's say, the the truth of my moment at this point. I started off on this particular question perhaps maybe about 10 or 11 years ago mm -hmm. or maybe even before I took up law as a profession. This was one of the reasons and uh, the idea of nationhood has confounded me for a long time and only over the last few years I have realized that perhaps as Swamiji's clip that you just played out I think is a fantastic starting point for this particular discussion, which is to say that you first understand Bharatiyata before you decide what is, let's say, the political entity that you look at. Okay. okay. The political entity that you look at today corresponds to an approximates to, let's say, a nation state, roughly speaking, that is how we have decided to mold ourselves. But for all practical purposes, I think it's a triangulation of sorts, it's an approximation of sorts which has been required by history perhaps because you were unshackling yourself from a colonizer a european colonizer there was a certain legacy that you inherited which you chose to continue with in the interest of continuum so that there is some kind of a vyavastha so there is some kind of a system in place so that the common person has some kind of a system to look up to this is something that you have inherited as part of a colonial legacy but do you want to continue with it is a question that you have never asked yourself. And perhaps even if you have asked yourself during the course of the, let's say the framing of the constitution, those discussions have never reached out to the common person subsequently. And therefore I believe that what we understand of this country today is a curious mix of myth, reality, fact and fiction without any uh, effort, serious effort being invested at the level of the state and dare I say even at the level of the society yeah. to perhaps make sense of our past and see how is it that we have straight jacketed our past into the concept of a nation state. Okay. okay. Now let me try and answer the question in a slightly more direct way. The understanding of the premise that if you have to be a nation you need a certain degree of homogeneity is not our way of thinking at all under any circumstances. Yeah. That is an inherited legacy. And if a nation is supposed to have homogeneity to the extent that there are no fights or there are no, let's say, uh, internecine wars at all or never 
uh, or never has a history of battles between communities, I don't think there's a single society or a single country which can rise up to those standards. Even within the Gauls, there were fights. Even within the Japanese society, there were fights. The identity of a Han China is more or less a created identity. It's an artificial identity. It has been created over centuries, perhaps maybe after, uh, for the last 200 years. So I think to try and start with the assumption that for you to be a nation, you must be homogeneous. There is a serious problem because the first question that needs to be asked is homogeneous at what level? What is the metric? Is it ethnicity? Is it religion? Or is it something else? Is it culture? These are the questions that we must ask ourselves. And there I believe that Bharat subscribes to a slightly different yardstick. Mm -hmm. Because for all practical purposes, what we know as Hinduism or what we know as Dharma or what we know as Sanatana Dharma is for all practical purposes an agglomeration of multiple sampradayas, multiple faith systems which are perhaps tied by the notion of Dharma to some extent. And I don't want to go beyond that because I'm not an expert in the subject. But my limited understanding tells me that the connect that you're looking at to tie each of these identities is not a religious connect, is not an ethnic connect, it's a spiritual connect. Correct. And this is not something that can ever be understood if you try and understand Bharat from a European experience. True. Bharat's experience is unique. Its identity is unique. Its understanding of Sanskriti and Sabhita is unique. Therefore, it makes very little sense to try and impose the trappings of European thought from nation statehood or let's say constitutionalism or anything else on this particular civilization because it's almost trying to understand the father by the yardstick of the son. Hmm. Makes really no sense. So therefore I would suggest that even if perhaps we don't have an answer, we at least start with the understanding that what we know today is insufficient, inadequate, incomplete and certainly does not do justice to Bharat as an entity. So how do we define ourselves? There are enough historians who were grappling with this particular question around the time of the independence movement because when you start clamoring for independence, the first response from the white Christian colonizer was, You're, you were not even a single country before I came to this particular right. land. So what is your claim to fame and how can you actually make a case for nation statehood? Nation state and independence. Absolutely. And independence. If you were not stitched together as a political entity prior to my entry, what makes your case stronger after my exit and how can you ask me as a single political unit to give you independence as a single political unit? So there you have to, and, and I've been trying to read that particular literature because I'm in the course of writing a book which is more or less public knowledge by now, where historians around that period, first of all, tried to understand this more from a civilizational sense. So a civilization whether it is an advanced stage of decay or it is in a stage of resurgence is for history and time to decide. But a civilization which has telescoped itself into this narrow prism called nation statehood, when it, when it struggles to straddle its between its identity as a civilization and its political reality as a nation statehood, the kind of confusion that a particular entity is supposed to go through, Bharat is a live textbook example of it. And as long as it doesn't strike a balance between its past and its present, its future is bound to be confused and confounded. So yes, therefore, there is a decent chance that the values that tie you together, which tie you to the land of this particular country and basically says that this is the history that I inherit, there is a decent chance as a consequence of adoption of that identity, you will other a few people because quite a few people may or may not subscribe to it. Absolutely. So be it is the straight answer to it. Okay. Because the process of formulation of an identity using any yardstick is bound to result in creating an other who does not conform to that identity or who does not subscribe to that identity or who is not part of that identity. Correct. That is no reason to alienate or abandon your identity. If you say that someone's your mother, that also means that someone is not, not that good. person is not the mother of someone else. Doesn't mean that you alienate your mother simply because the other doesn't relate to that particular mother. Right? So that I think is a clarity that is required. But I think we are valuing in a certain misplaced understanding of universalism and we confuse spiritual universalism with political geopolitical realities. And as long as we continue to conflate between the two, I think we will neither be spiritually universal nor will we be real political according to me. That confusion will continue for some time. Okay. Interestingly, uh, when, you, when you spoke about the, the confusions that would come as a result of we not being very clear in terms of or rather not reconciling between the identity the cultural identities of the past and the political identity of the present yeah. 
Um, while I agree that there is going to be a good amount of confusion, which we see in the society as we speak, right. uh, but when we do this othering that happens, uh, there is going to be a good amount of conflict as well. Correct. Right. And um, and the 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 Hindu response to conflict in the last few years has has often seemed to be inadequate, or right. uh, you know, it's it's not been effective enough to even even to assert some of the some of the basic uh, you know aspects of equality, which right. which the constitution is supposed to actually promise. So, what do you think those conflicts would? I mean, what kind of a conflicts do you think can come out of it, and how best do you think it can be addressed in a way that, you know, the uh, the broad cultural premise of uh, you know universal secularism, which is fundamental to Hinduism, is not compromised. Based on my very limited, untrained uh, understanding of dharma and its philosophy, chaos is a reality. Chaos is to be accepted and chaos is permanent. Chaos leads to change. Or maybe it's a cycle where both feed off each other. And if chaos takes the form of conflict, the question is, uh, is it for the right reasons? What is the end goal that is being aimed at? What is the motivation here? I don't think conflict is something that we must be worried about or be scared of. If Sagar Manthan itself is a textbook example or a Puranic example or, a, or an Itihasic example of conflict, it was nothing but a conflict. I don't see how is it that we can try and evade conflict. Not possible. The question is, are you undertaking it for the right reasons? Okay. Are you doing your best to avoid that conflict? Have you employed every possible means to offer the olive branch? And if left with no other option, and forced to take a position, do you first of all have the guts and second the wherewithal to, do, to embrace it? And therefore I believe in at each of these levels perhaps we need serious introspection but all of this calls for two very specific traits according to me. While it is a politically incorrect terminology to use, I will use it for whatever it's worth regardless of the reactions. Brahmanatham and Kshatra Tejam, you need both. Okay. And Brahmanatham, I don't use it in the sense of a caste. caste it's not no, I don't use it in the sense of I a understand. caste. The pursuit of knowledge. Pursuit of knowledge and the guts to speak the truth. Okay. Regardless of the consequences okay. and regardless of the number of people who are arrayed against you. Even if the rest of the world is arrayed against you, if you believe that you are right, do not budge from your position under any circumstances, come hell or high water. That is the essence of a Brahmin. That is the essence of Brahminhood. That is the essence of Brahminism, dare I say it. That is Brahminical, the much maligned word. Kshatram effectively means, once you have decided that this is the truth you are fighting for, are you willing to protect it? Are you willing to push it? Are you willing to defend it under any circumstances? Because of all the four Varnas that the Chaturvana system effectively believes in and puts stock in, the Kshatriya is perhaps the most important because it is his sword that effectively ensures that everybody else has the freedom to live and practice their own dharma. The Brahmin perhaps teaches you how what is dharma, but the practice of dharma is made possible by the Kshatriya who wields the sword and says, I will protect the rest of the society and I am willing to sacrifice my life and my own longevity so to speak at the altar of dharma. And therefore, as much as you need a lot of people who propagate the truth, the truth is always bound to inspire uncivil responses and 9 out of 10 times violent responses, which I think is effectively what's going on. And as long as your response is uh, churning out this misplaced pacifist sense of Hindu dharma, I'm sorry to say you have not understood the meaning of Shastra and Shastra going together. And today I believe that we have perhaps a surfeit of Shastra in several ways with a lot of people talking, but a serious deficit of Shastra. And that's where I think the Indian state needs to rethink. Because I don't think the Indian state has done a fantastic job or even a great job of giving people the confidence that if they speak the truth, the state will stand by them and protect them. The state effectively has failed in its duty to protect those who wish to seek the adva to advance the truth of this particular land. And therefore, I think the state is pushing people into looking into certain alternatives. 
non-state alternatives, dare I say. So maybe it's for the state and perhaps this is the best possible time for us to ask these questions. Maybe because I believe that the stars have aligned in a certain fashion. And therefore, given that there is a certain thought process at play, that thought process must empower the advancement of dharmic truth in every manner possible, at every front possible, at every level possible. So essentially what I hear you say is this, Sai, that you know, there is, a, there is an identity uh, that is being reasonably well established and institutionalized, but that is still the nation state identity. Correct. Uh, which is which does not represent or which doesn't do justice Correct. to what this land represents, which is actually a civilizational state more Correct. than a more than a nation state. Correct. And that transition, uh, you, you say, is not going to be. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a it's a moral imperative, so to speak. It's not going to be easy. Uh, but no matter what the cost is, uh, it needs to be carried out for the simple reason that that's probably the right thing to do. Let me call it a dharmic imperative. Yeah, got it. And following dharma, I don't think, is an option in that particular sense. Yes. Perhaps an individual has the option of defining for himself what dharma is. But at the level of the society, dharma does not have an alternative. True. And when I use dharma, I don't use it in the sense of religion. Because religion is a colonial term which does no justice to the concept of dharma. has got absolutely no bearing at all. If at all there is an equivalent, then you have to look at perhaps the Latin equivalent, which is J-U-S, Jus which is the concept of righteousness, righteous conduct. Dharma perhaps is in some sense righteous conduct, but then dharma has different applications at different levels. Sure. So if the state believes that it is a civilizational state, then effectively the morality of this particular state and the compass at which this particular state must be oriented is dharma. And if that is effectively your means as well as the end, then you have to do whatever is necessary to protect it and advance it. Because the belief is advancement of dharma is not just for individual good and not just for let's say national or civilizational good, but it is good for the rest of the world. And for a country that believes that it has the ability to be Vishwaguru, I think you must take that chance. Take the chance. Okay. Got it. So like you said, you know, you know, dharma is a very complex phenomenon, right? right? I mean it's so complex that like you said, you know, there is no word equivalent uh, in, in most languages. For instance, I mean English doesn't I mean righteousness is one word that is often used as a synonym uh, right. uh, and uh, but unfortunately in India the word it is equated to masab in some context which Correct. I think is, is is absolutely incorrect so to speak um, so the, the question is that you know dharma as a concept is fundamentally predicated on uh, deep thought uh, a lot of contemplation and meditation so to speak and, right. and that is what builds the ca capacity to address some of the nuanced issues that comes with its you know perception right but in this internet era, you know, where everything happens so quickly and there is a simplistic reduction of even the most complex things uh, or there is a there is a general sense of irreverence towards towards things of greater meaning. Right. How do you think, uh, you know, those challenges can be addressed, especially when we want to take on a monumental task such as moving the, the identity of, you know, a nation that has 1.3 billion people from, you know, a nation state to a civilizational state. You know, how do we reconcile this challenge? So let me give you a counterfactual. You have religion, you have dharma, you have mazhab. Yeah. Okay. We start on the premise that dharma is not equal to religion, is not equal to mazhab. Sure. None of them is equal to the other. Let's assume that is the case. And perhaps there is a connection between religion and mazhab because there is an Abrahamic base there. True. Okay, let's assume that is the case. Which is purely a faith-based faith -based and approach. a book-based and a belief. -based. Let's assume that is the case. The presence of the internet and the presence of democratization of opinion has not made a difference to followers of religion and followers of mazhab when it comes to their confidence and conviction and knowledge. Hmm. Why has it made a difference to followers of dharma? So, internet is not the problem. Technology is not the problem. Proliferation of information is not the problem. Hmm. The problem is something more fundamental that is deeper. That's precisely why I've chosen a few causes and I've chosen to pursue a few causes okay. as pro bono commitments, of course, out of my, outside of my regular commitments, which is your institutions, not state institutions, I understand. your dharmic institutions, institutions are your bulwarks, which are tasked and charged with the duty of producing individuals who keep a certain knowledge system and a way of life alive. Okay. If those institutions have been diluted and those institutions have been relegated to an ornamental status, automatically the people who are produced by those institutions are given a certain titular role, but they don't actually play a role in your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me be blunt. 
so that's failing in duties that is failing in that's duties the and therefore here's a situation that i don't think the kind of role that a religious institution and representatives of a religious institution play in the lives of let's say the abrahamic faith systems is the role that we have accorded to our own institutions True. so we are responsible for secularization of our own lives and now we ask ourselves how do we address this particular issue because there are more technologies that are facilitating the secularization of this no secularization has set in because you have chosen to create more than arm's length distance between those institutions which are supposed to guide you and which are supposed to give you two things mm -hmm. personal knowledge personal guidance and most importantly a sense of community okay which is why you always find yourself slightly lonely when you decide to take certain causes because you have killed that particular cord that connects you with your institution now the question is here you're dealing with organized central institutions of a certain category so are we supposed to refa refashion ourselves in the same mold no that's not the answer you never ask these questions from the 7th century perhaps until 1757 the first battle of fort plassey that was the first battle that you're looking at until then you never ask these questions the existence of caste as a structure the existence of multiple identities the existence of multiple sampradayas was not the issue you are the only entity you are the only culture to have survived that particular ravage that's right spain was occupied for such a long time until they had reconquista byzantine empire is gone from constantinople it has become istanbul Correct. what are we really talking about yeah. so if you look at it you have actually succeeded in defending yourself significantly yeah. right and given that these questions are being asked now because post that you have consumed a certain form of knowledge and a certain form of history which is not your version at all absolutely so if you were to put faith in your institutions i am not saying they were perfect or they are meant to be the same way for the rest of eternity they would have organically evolved with time that is the nature okay however what is important is those institutions ensured that you had something closely to relate to and for which you had an incentive to protect and defend and die for so think of it like an army for a moment no soldier dies for the army or the country he dies for his company his corps his unit his regiment so he is dying for his flag flag what flag the colors of his regiment that's what he dies for so there is a relatable proximate identity which gives you a sense of bonding with the rest of the community and a purpose and a purpose a very specific purpose an identified purpose which you live on a daily basis that is exactly why you have let's say certain societal structures duties that follow the societal structures there is a safety net that comes with it therefore there are societal practices that keep it alive like endogamous marriages or so forth whether they are relevant or not today is a different question altogether okay, got it. but you have chosen to look at your entire past with a certain sense of sanctimony and judgment you say i will start with the premise of negativity as far as my past is concerned so technology will only aid that negativity you be positive technology will multiply the positivity okay. but if you start with the point of negativity you are bound to actually end up in negativity so it's not a question of technology okay. it's a question of putting faith in your institutions strengthening those institutions empowering those institutions so it's a fundamental reorientation not withstanding what the technological progress is right because the Correct. larger issue is i mean so the technology fundamentally amplifies whatever the the relationship is let me take a pot shot at my own profession technology is like a lawyer you pay to dance to anybody's tunes okay okay technology is only a medium which can multiply a certain thought okay what counts is the thought which chooses to employ the technology towards a certain objective certain okay as long as you have lack of clarity in intent and goal not withstanding the best of resources that are thrown at you you can do nothing so what is the test always if assume for a moment you believe that ideally i need x amount of resources to ideate create and achieve a certain objective and you choose to give that as an excuse for lack of action mm -hmm. if you were given everything that you asked for do you have a plan of action if you don't have a plan of action and you constantly say until the resources arrive i will not think of a plan of action that means you are saying i will not prepare until the opportunity presents itself you should always be prepared when the opportunity okay. presents itself you move on the front foot and you hit it for a six it. that's the basic point i understand do you think the idea of secularism can be agnostic to the the cultural and the historical context of the society it operates secularism has never been agnostic to culture okay. secularism has never been uh, agnostic to religion please read religious context absolutely absolutely 
secularism as understood in europe is christian secularism we are the only ones to actually understand it as mil uh, militantly religious secularism mm. and we constantly look at the uh, the french revolution to this no french revolution made a very clear exception towards the treatment of jews also mm -hmm. there are specific legislations to the effect there are sp specific policies that they adopted secularism in europe which is where we seem to be tracing its antecedents to and have adopted it from, it's has secular. never been secular. Okay. Secularism has never been secular. It's a Christian secularism. It's a Christian secularism. And its entire origin has been that I rebel from papal authority, and I rebel from the Pope, and I rebel from the, let's say, the domination of Catholic Church, and therefore all princely states, all principalities, all feudalities effectively say, I don't want to be, uh, let's say, subject to the Prussian Empire. I don't want to be subject to the Augsburg Empire or the House of Augsburg. And therefore, I want to be rid of the shackles of the Catholic Church as well as the Augsburg House. And now I want to come out with a separate principality altogether. That is effectively what we know as the Protestant Reformation, leading to the Westphalian peace of 1648 and then ultimately leading to the nation state as a concept. But every nation state in Europe was very clear that it was a Christian nation state. So is your US. Absolutely. The peace of Westphalia was not about establishing a secular state. The peace of Westphalia was asking itself only three questions, or rather three denominations. Apart from the Catholic Church, which are the other two permanent denominations of Christianity that shall be recognized henceforth? True. Protestantism, and the third one that we don't talk about is Calvinism. Okay. Calvinism is also a broad, let's say, basket of Protestantism, both of which rebelled against Catholicism. And both of them said, we don't wish to subscribe by your dogma, allow us to do it on our own. And therefore, every European colonizer, once he started colonizing the rest of the world, was actually fighting for Protestant Christian expansionism, which is stated in papal documents, which is stated in their parliamentary debates. You only have to read the British National Parliament debates from 1833 onwards, and you will clearly see that they were fighting for Christianity. <laughs> East India Company and others may have fought for trade or whatever it may be. Right. But the state, when it decided to take action, was very clear that it was taking action to further a specific ontology, epistemology, and theology. Sure. There is no running away from it at all. So secularism has never been secular. Anybody who understands it otherwise has not read history. Right. And this is more pronounced when it comes to empires like the, the Spanish Empire or the Portugal Empire, which are actually Catholic in nature. Correct. And because over there, the Inquisition, the extent of Inquisition that they imposed on some of the, the colonial subjects was far, far more pronounced and for the matter, very violent compared to, you know, the, the Protestant establishments like the British. So I think Spain and Portugal, we think of uh, the British as the first colonizers, but no, it was actually Spain and Portugal first, That's right. right? Christopher Columbus not, was not an Englishman for all practical purposes, right? The Colombian expedition, I think of 1492, was not an English expedition. Absolutely. And the document that you should perhaps consider looking at is a document that came out, I think, in May 1498. It's called Inter Cetera, issued by either Pope Alexander the Sixth or Pope Augustine, I don't remember exactly. And that was a papal bull, which is papal farman, papal authority, papal diktat, a papal, uh, papal fiat, issued to both Spain and Portugal, dividing the rest of the new world, that is non-Christian world, between these two people saying, you colonize this from this latitude to this longitude, colonize you colonize this. this from this latitude to this, uh, that longitude, and India is mentioned there. Okay. Okay, India is mentioned there, because all of them are looking for India, and three words were used. Colonize, evangelize, or enslave. This is the language, and you're doing it in the name of and for the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Okay. It's mentioned in the documents, it's publicly available. Anybody has to simply search for it. I'll spell it out I N T E R C A E T E R A, inter cetera. That's the document. Search for it, you'll find it on Google. Mm -hmm. Tell me I'm wrong. It's not. Okay. So when these people started off with these with these notions and colonization had a very clear evangelist expansionism behind it, how do we assume that they were secular? God. What is the basis for assuming that they were secular? Why? Because they established the railways in this country. So what? <laughs> I don't see how that makes any difference. I understand. So now, I mean, it is interesting. You spoke about the the intent of both the Portugal and the Spanish Empire to kind of proselyte, I mean, to conquer the, the uh, I mean, colonize. Whole of the world, right. you know, between the two of them, and and obviously they had a very clear intent to proselytize, uh, you know, the subjects there. Correct. Now, if you look at Article Twenty Five of the Constitution, it gives right. the right to practice religion. Right. Right. Now, the right to proselytize or convert 
is integral to some of the faiths that are existing in the country okay. so their right to practice religion could actually mean you know right to proselytize in that sense in in some sense which is an absolute conflict with the religions that belong to this land right so is there a need to kind of have a serious check on this whole aspect of looking at religion from the perspective of just expanding the the you know the followership base and from that perspective i want to you know hear you uh, or uh, hear your opinion on some of the anti conversion laws that have been brought by some of the state governments in the recent past see in fact it touches a slightly more fundamental aspect and there's a decent chance that my answer may shock you hmm. because i think i will split the answer in two different baskets okay the first basket is questioning the basic assumption that dharma is a non proselytizing faith i don't believe it is a non proselytizing faith at all several groups have been made part of dharma by giving him a specific status in this particular society that is how the jati system or the varna system effectively evolved so for me for all practical purposes one of the reasons perhaps or one of the triggers perhaps for the the caste system was to invite people into this particular dharmic society and give them a particular station in this particular society depending on their let's say the guna karma or whatever it may be okay so i am not willing to buy entirely that we are a non presentizing faith okay that is something that we have told ourselves repeatedly how much of it is based in reality how much of it is based in a self i mean a, a self fulfilling lie i'm not sure of it but none of this proselytization uh, which which you just spoke about was you know a, a, a form of proselytization where you deny that's exactly what i'm coming what to. someone is practicing right? so the thing is if you wish to be a part of my society this is a, a certain status that i'm willing to offer and you will be given a certain degree of respect and your your enclave or your island will be respected now what is the difference if they choose not to actually be a part of this particular society and they rebel against its basic tenets I think there are enough examples to ask ourselves whether they were allowed to live in this place or not. Okay. I don't know why is it that we are running away from it. We shouldn't be running away from it. Why? There is always going to be a nexus between a form of consciousness, a form of identity, a form of theology or a form of ontology or a form of epistemology and a certain territory or a certain geography. What defines Bharat? Mm-hmm. And if you read Radha Kumar Mukherjee's book Uh, on on what makes uh, bharat a hindu society is the establishment of a network of pilgrimage centers across the country tying it up as one single unit first while afghanistan or let's say first while the shahi dynasty before it became afghanistan or you go to the uh, east or the west or the north or the south Absolutely. there is a network of institutions yes. and these are religious institutions which is what made it bharat a single entity okay so i think even uh, diana ek has written brilliantly in a book uh, bharat a sacred geography mm-hmm. this is a sacred geography yeah, true. therefore you don't look at it as territory it's not a territory to be ruled over it's not a territory which needs to be conquered it's a territory to be venerated because we believe that our gods lived here that our heroes lived here that they have venerated this particular land it is the land of heroes and rishis and seers and what not yeah. okay therefore our relationship to this particular land is one of veneration that is the primary distinction between an outsider who looks at it as a territory which has been conquered and a geographical entity and a geography that we venerate True. okay that's one so there i think we need to rethink a bit so the first question is why do we assume that we don't have the right to convert hmm. and why do we believe that we are not a religion that doesn't convert i don't think you should take away that particular weapon from your ammunition or your arsenal at all you should equally have the power to do it after all if there are hindus in uh, in russia or in europe or in america how is that even possible unless and until you believe that all of these people could become part of the hindu society or the dharmic society that's one second retaining the power of conversion with you you can still argue differently about somebody else's right to convert in this particular country if bharat is primarily the home of dharma mm-hmm. then dharma must have a certain degree of primacy over anybody else and everybody else true and i use dharma in a civilizational sense i don't need to use it in a religious sense at all absolutely so if you believe in a certain faith system that results in the annihilation of dharma or the subjugation of dharma or the marginalization of dharma or the extermination of dharma sorry can't happen won't work because the public morality of this particular country is defined by dharma absolutely and anything that is at loggerheads with dharma 
and believes that either it has to survive or dharma must survive and both cannot survive as two swords in a single scabbard then the single sword that can survive in the scabbard is dharma true i can take the considered position because after all that is the position taken by 52 countries belonging to a certain mazhab hmm. that is the position taken by several countries correct in israel the treatment of non judaic faith systems is different true in japan the treatment of christianity is different so what is it that we are beating the bush around for which others aren't there is a certain degree of i'd say self doubt mm-hmm. which is the reason that we don't square up to these questions i don't need to say i don't convert why do you want to convert Got it. i am going to say this is a land which belongs to my ancestors therefore i have the right to convert people who wish to live here but you don't know. but your fealty your loyalty and the origin of your consciousness is either in europe or in the middle east so i'm sorry you cannot say that your consciousness has equal right in this particular territory mm-hmm. because public morality is defined by public consciousness which is defined by civilizational consciousness when public morality is interpreted and i'll give you a, a, a straight example certain patents or let's say certain inventions can't be granted patents under patent law and as someone who practices intellectual property law i know what i'm talking about uh, if they defy public morality okay okay if a certain invention has the tendency or the propensity I, okay. to affect public morality you can't get a patent yeah. because the state cannot legitimize a certain right which has the effect of going against public morality yeah. so public morality has been interpreted in several judgments the european patent office when asking itself what is public morality for the for the purposes of europe says it is european civilization european values they are blunt about it so what is european values let them ask answer that question i don't need to answer that question but i have the right to spe- specifically say public morality as far as bharat is concerned is morality that is drawn from a certain thought that has emanated from this particular land and that venerates this particular land i don't need to beat around the bush for this at all and i survive and i survive for thousands of thousands of years, of years. therefore hopefully it shall therefore the point is article 25 perhaps we should stop approaching it from the perspective of a victim got it you're a victim because you're not even squaring up to what your own origins are and what your rights are you're proceeding under the assumption that the other side has an expansionist tendency whereas i have never had one then how did southeast asia become hindu got it i don't need to see the uh, beat around the bush on this particular question so therefore every thought has a certain sphere of influence therefore it has a certain geography of influence dharmic thought has a certain geography of influence has a certain sphere of influence and bharat is its primary sphere of influence and bharat is its epicenter its origin okay. therefore why can how can you speak of akhand bharat so to speak right. unless until you believe that all of this has a shared identity at least from the past, past. i think dr ambedkar has written brilliantly on this particular book notwithstanding my disagreements with him in significant respects in pakistan and the partition Pakistan's of india right. brilliantly is written this i think chapter 4 he discusses this entire thing and he says why are you guys running away from the concept of a two nation theory it is true because these are two different civilizations all together absolutely so the chairman of the drafting committee of the constitution was a believer of the two nation theory okay and that's interesting dravida inatten niram karpu dravida inatten unavu dosai this is a tweet that you had put about there's a third sentence to it <laughs> yeah i know but i think this is where i want to stop <laughs> so this is a tweet that you had put about right. like two weeks back and uh, so you're from the south you've been in delhi for quite some time i presume yeah so which one do you prefer dosa or chole bhature depends on my mood but okay. i'm someone who loves indian cuisine wherever okay. it comes from okay and uh, i'm sure i haven't grown the way i have by having a limited cuisine or culinary tastes So uh, I, I mean, as long as it's vegetarian and as long as it's Indian, I'm all game for it. Great. For a lot of people who come from Tamil Nadu, especially, you know, the their love for the idea of India is also, or the idea of Bharat, the civilizational concept of the, of of this geography, uh, is also predicated on their love for their own language. Correct. Right. Correct. And uh, and culture, for that matter. Correct. but you know given the promotion of the the aryan dravidian divide because of for political reasons uh, to many this kind of seems like to be at cross purpose right 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 now this further is complicated by what many call as attempts to impose hindi uh, on a, a section of people who speak right. a language which is far more ancient than right, hindi right. itself right so how do we view and address this and tell the world that someone like me right i mean me opposing hindi opposition is not 
me challenging the idea of the the, the civilizational state it's right. just that you know i am an as much in love with the idea of bharat Correct. as i am with my language Correct. so how does this especially in a country where majority of these people you know speak hindi how, how how does this message get communicated in a very very succinct and cogent fashion i think perhaps we should uh, try and understand this issue from two different perspectives one is between two internal identities saying that there is perhaps an identity which subscribes to let's say the hindi identity the other subscribes to the tamil identity the other is when two internal identities fight who benefits and therefore is there an external hand hmm. as far as bharat is concerned i am not a conspiracy theorist i have enough evidence to show this there is enough material to show this hmm. that when two internal identities fight always look for where the money is coming from always look at the money trail who is funding whom who is pushing for what that's a question that i've learned to answer i mean ask over over let's say the last 5 or 6 years especially the innocence with which i looked at these particular questions i think has gone okay and there is a decent chance that i'm i'm, I'm less innocent about these issues or more aware so more aware hopefully and uh, what i've realized is there is and that's exactly the central thesis of what i'm writing uh when the the european so the difference between the colonization before the european entered here and the european colonization is one primarily put faith in the use of force okay and the other put faith in the use of the mind in a slightly different fashion and therefore the european colonizers impact has been much more lasting has been much more deep and has been much more entrenching okay and that's why you're trying to grapple with it secularism was certainly not the concept introduced by mohammed bin qasim i don't think he did that right it was something that was done by the white christian colonizer right so as far as i am concerned history tells me that whenever the european colonizer has entered an indigenous society his obsession with race translated to him imputing racial motives to societal structures of the indigenous society got it that has happened in other jurisdictions any number of jurisdictions read the history of latin america mm. read the history of caribbean read the history of africa africa Right. or even for that matter new zealand or australia True. what we understand of caste and what we understand of tribe today is effectively a consequence of the european colonizers obsession with white christianity True. that is his own writing john lock who we worship as an economist True. and as a political thinker and one of the enlightenment's leading thinkers and all that specifically said that the white christian is the epitome of human perfection this these were his thoughts until the age of 70 In fact, I think John Locke also actually said that it is a white Christian male. Correct. It's the it's so not even so patriarchy, white Christianity, all of this. People don't realize it can be significantly traced to Enlightenment values, and we constantly look at Enlightenment as if it was global Enlightenment. True. No, there was European Enlightenment. True. They had Dark Ages. We never suffered from Dark Ages. Absolutely. So why do we actually subscribe to right. their notions of Enlightenment? Right. So if you look at that, when they came to the Indian society, since he was so obsessed with. race 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 and color and color and color he chose to divide the indian society into different races got and into different ethnicities because ethnicity mattered to him not to uh, us got it tribes have lived alongside or let's say the the uh, what we call as uh, the panchamas people who are outside the chaturvarna system who live in the forests and who who do not subscribe to the rules of the city and the village the sabha and the nagara or let's say the grama are people who must be allowed to live their way of life because the they are the only ones who've managed to crack the code of keeping nature alive absolutely as long as tribal identity survives nature survives as long as the tribal way of life survives nature survives that is the trick that we have cracked which is why we have chosen not to interfere with them at all hmm. seeing those are enclaves which are not to be interfered with True. civilization can be outside of it but let them continue to live their way of life because they know something that we don't no, right. because we believe in the concept of received wisdom hmm. now therefore why is this important the understanding of aryans dravidians and all of this how is it that all of this comes about when the european christian is here true did you did you have this question before okay. got it if this question did not arise on the horizon before and you you celebrate the chodas also because he goes right until ganga he subjugates that particular territory and still has no problem inviting people from there and establishing what is known as chaturvedi mangalam in every city that they establish which is to ensure that the brahmins have a certain place in the center of the city because they are seen as people who are meant to teach who are meant to impart education and also produce knowledge if that has been the treatment when did this start division start 
And if the division started because of the presence of a certain person, why should I not be looking at what is it that the person gains through this particular division? division? True. And if there are people who latch on to the particular division, I am sorry to say you have fallen for the age old trick. Or you continue to gain from the division. Or you gain from that particular division in the, in the short run, but you will pay for it in the long run. Yeah. Which is to say, the idea is to gradually co-opt one strand after another into the, color, in the, into the colonizer's mindset. That's exactly what's happening. True. True. So when you speak of uh, Pope or Caldwell or these people who were sitting and translating Tamil scripture or let's say Tamil works, what were they doing it for? To propagate the greatness of Tamil to the rest of the world? That's not what they did. True. After all, they use that knowledge against us. That's exactly what has happened. So that is one level of response. But the other level of response is to realize that you can't constantly blame the outsider. Absolutely. There is something that you must also look at. Yeah. And there I believe, as someone who's lived in Delhi for close to from 2009 onwards, I, a lot of people have a lot of neg negative things to say about Delhi. I love this place. It's a sea of opportunities. It's a land of opportunities. Sure. I don't see the point in spitting at a certain place, which is your karma bhumi. Mm -hmm. So I will never ever speak ill of this particular place. And merely because I come from the south, I'm not going to say that, oh, this is better, that is better. Absolutely. If you feel that's better, you should go back to that place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no point in living in one place and then saying that the other living place is the better. Other place. Okay. So that's one. Two, I think there is a certain degree of interaction that is necessary. And the fight is about who's older, whose language is older. Mm. You celebrate the diversity of your language. You keep your language alive at least in a place where you are in the majority mm -hmm. and then you talk of imposing it in other places. Okay. Okay. That's I think that's the first thing that you must do. Hindi should first be chased Hindi before it wants to go to any other place. Mm -hmm. Okay. As long as it seems to be interspersed with a lot of words which are certainly not from Sanskrit or any other Indian language, mm -hmm. I don't see the point in actually saying I'll go and talk about it in different places. Absolutely. At the same time, you must give let's say urbanization or intra-globalization a certain opportunity because when you come out of your home state you're bound to learn the language of the place where you're going to work absolutely yes. so economics is going to face force you to do that assume for a moment that any leader from north india i don't believe in that concept decides to go to south india and he wants to uh, let's say get a certain chunk of votes or he wants to attract those people you will automatically have to don the same dress that you do so when Mr. Modi decides to meet Xi Jinping, Jinping yeah, he, wore he, was, he wore the dress, that's right? Right. That's right? So whether it is politics or economics, it's going to force you to do a few things which True. you may or may not want to do. True. Therefore, that's one aspect of it. But when you start realizing that you're a civilization and that you've always functioned as a decentralized unitary unit, mm -hmm. which is to say that you have separate identities in different places and you've still functioned as a single unit, automatically the sense of insecurity from which you operate, I think will come down significantly. Therefore, all of this only reiterates the value of history. And therefore, you have to understand your own past. Is it anybody's case that before the Englishman came, people living in the border of what is today Odisha and what is today Andhra Pradesh were not talking to each other? What language were they talking to in each other? I mean, they were, at, at the end of the day, they must have learned each other's languages Absolutely. or there must have been some kind of a common lingua franca. Absolutely. What was it? Let's ask the question. Surely it was not English. Surely it was not Hindi. Surely it was not Urdu. Hmm. What is this? So I think maybe if we start asking questions which are even about thousand years old, Absolutely. maybe there's a decent chance that our, our entire thinking might change. Okay. Got it. And I, I, I consciously believe that all these sensitive discussions are perhaps happening at the worst possible plane, which is the political plane. True, I agree. A political plane is the worst possible plane for having these discussions because it is rife with uh, manipulation, it is rife with machination opportunism. and opportunism. Therefore, I believe that this is a discussion that should be had at the level of the society. And you don't need to take diversity classes for Indians. You need to take it for the European or the American. You don't need to take it for us. We don't have a problem with anybody at all. True. Right? So once we realize this, there's a decent chance that there will be greater degree of acceptance and there will be a greater degree of wanting to understand the other person's culture as well. How many people know that Mr. Khattar, the Chief Minister of Haryana, speaks fluently in Tamil? Tamil he even true. delivered a speech in that. That there are certain states which have actually given southern languages a certain, uh, let's say, position in their curriculum, so to speak. Absolutely. Why don't we start doing that as opposed to, let's say, spewing venom on each other? Got Somebody else is always going to benefit because you're a global minority. Never forget that. Hmm. You may consider yourself a majority in this country, which I think will be, is a, is a, is a dying truth. But at least realize that you're a global minority and behave with that sense of responsibility. Got it. I understand. 
so there has been in the last few years you know there has been a significant amount of uh, you know interference by the judiciary uh, in the executive's domain and also into other domains right i mean for instance uh, they have a view on um, you know where liquor should be sold close to a highway and there is there has been a lot of uh, in fact i i personally worked on this as part of my previous engagement where i actually kind of we did a bit of a study and we found out that the liquor consumption in the state of goa actually went up uh because of this pr- provision because 500 meters was the rule 500 meters is the rule yeah. for the simple reason that uh, t- a lot of these uh, you know transport i mean the drivers they realize that you're not going to, you may not get liquor once i cross this you know liquor shop so i might as well buy and and store it for my for my entire journey a small nugget i was involved in the matter in the second round okay and the funny part was the court realized since all highways don't have the same breadth and length 500 meters in some places bring it brings it closer closer okay that's interesting <laughs> so so in that or even within the city it brings it closer closer so people went back and said this is a violation of article 14 because you can't have the same distance for the entire country country got it so so in that sense you know i mean whatever the intentions are but there are certain things which is which is clearly a domain of the executive right and you know the supreme court also has interest in running something like the bcci you know right. which is which is you know god knows whose business it is right but then you know to me this kind of gross i mean smacks of gross insensitivity given the fact that you have about 4 crore cases pending and about more correct. than 60000 cases just in the supreme court alone. more than 60000 in uh, just in the supreme court alone. correct right so as a common man uh, you know how do you think this these problems can be fixed which is judiciary not entering the domain of the executive and also you know in terms of carrying out judicial reforms to the extent that the faith of the common man is restored in the judiciary which today seems to be going after uh, you know hogging headlines and limelight as against actually alleviating the suffering or mitigating the suffering of the common man how how, how do we actually see the bridge? thing is uh, after a very long time perhaps in 2014 you had a fairly non fractious mandate electoral True. mandate True. which resulted in creating a state or let's say a government which is not constantly on tenter hooks hmm. which is not constantly dependent on some coalition partner or got the it. other got it and they can even afford to lose a few coalition partners which they have in fact they can afford to lose anyone anyone they still right? survive with the 303 seats there. that i think is perhaps the right moment to undertake certain reforms and to also give what i would call an institutional push back pushback. to basically say i think maybe multiple coalition governments and minority governments have led to a point where arrogation of a certain degree of power has resulted in the hands of a certain body or organ now maybe you should consider giving up that space mm-hmm. okay but let's say giving up power is like giving up a seat in an unreserved compartment in the indian train once you've got it you will never vacate it got it okay even there is someone who is needier or who once, you vacate, once you vacate it you may not get it you may not get it back right so that's the fear under which you operate So considering that power once taken I don't think can be given back. And therefore I think maybe we will witness a certain churn in that particular respect. Mm-hmm. The NJAC I think was a step in the right direction. Perhaps it could have done with a few tweaks. Okay. I'm not going to say that the NJAC was 100% right in terms of the mechanism being proposed or the specifics of it. And uh but in principle I think it was a movement in the right direction because the system that we see which we you know as the collegium system got it. where uh, the member of a particular organ uh, appoints his own successor Got which it. i don't think happens anywhere, anywhere else, else is something is a consequence of three decisions hmm. and the njsc was a fantastic opportunity to open that particular issue out for discussion and say Good. let's discuss this why should we think of this as some final book or some final revelation to say thus far and no further that can't be the argument at all that's right and if an institution believes that it is it does not need reform it is beyond reform and it is above reform can it propose and suggest reform to others that's true okay that's a problem there's no local standard there's no local standard Absolutely. you at least look inward true. and as someone who certainly respects the institution who believes that the institution has done a fair amount of good has given a certain amount of relief to the common person when executive has failed or when the legislature has failed especially in matters of sexual harassment the vishakha guidelines which the supreme court came out with was a consequence of legislative vacuum to deal with sexual harassment in the workplace a lot of things that the supreme court has done is indeed laudable and they had to step up because you can't tell the common person other two organs have failed you don't come to me because i can't do anything absolutely that is effectively the doctrine of necessity kicking into uh, let's say existence got it. So now that there is a non-fractious mandate perhaps both organs must speak with each other mm-hmm. instead of slugging it out in public because if they do it in public then public loses confidence in both institutions mm. 
and according to me if the public loses confidence in the judiciary that is much more dangerous yeah, than the public losing confidence, confidence in the executive or the legislature simply because there is always a certain degree of cynicism associated with politics and politicians so there is a normalization of their expectation to say this is how it's going to be but can you can you have the same attitude towards the judiciary, judiciary. that's deadly dangerous yeah. because once you lose it that's it you, you, you're not going to win that you're not going to win it back because you don't have the ability to talk to people directly Absolutely. you're not a transparent body in that sense True. opacity is and rife you, in the way you're not accessible either. you're not accessible you don't want to be accessible Correct. and it's not good for you you're meant to be a reticent body all the more reason that you conduct yourself in a manner it's almost like the crown exactly you know it's, it's i would call it it's like the roman catholic church okay because the roman catholic church thinks of itself or thought of itself as being above the king because they hold the gates to heaven yeah. therefore the earthly power must listen to the unearthly power got it okay that's how they operate yeah. be it the king or the subjects exactly so therefore here's a situation that perhaps this particular institution is seeing itself in the same mold mm. i've said this in writing as much and i've said this in very respectful terms i think i'm exercising my right to free speech when i say this therefore i believe that this institution in its own interest in the interest of preserving its majesty in the interest of preserving public's confidence in that particular institution must see its space and regain its moral standing in the eyes of the public and set an example for other institutions when they do that automatically i think the confidence of the public in this institution will see spikes got it and uh, do you see any kind of a movement towards that over the last 10 years because in my in my opinion i think in the last 10 years is when the perception of the supreme court uh, you know has kind of taken a beating for for various reasons but do you see that transition happening given the fact that we've had two governments which have been elected with a with a, with a thumping majority let me respond that with a question thrown at you please the supreme court's order in the farm loss case true do you think was a case of ceding space or taking space i think that was an attempt at you know enabling to find a common ground between the two be that as it may purely from a jurisdiction standpoint yeah, okay did the supreme court have a constitutional basis to ask the government to negotiate with the people and consider staying the laws mm -hmm. is that something that is legally possible or constitutionally possible i have framed the question i leave it for the audience members to draw their own conclusions but in my opinion no that's it okay so, so if happen. that has happened in 2020 or 2021 I don't have any basis to say that I am confident that we are moving in the right direction. Right direction. Got it. I understand. I hope you are not fined rupees one for whatever you just said now. But <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is, uh, I I strike a fair balance between speaking on a certain policy and going after individuals. I can never ever be found going after individuals unless and until I have a specific issue, and even there, the discussion will be about the conduct of a certain individual or the policy. policy. as far as that particular individual is concerned beyond that i don't go into the talk it it makes no sense it at all no sense. it's like resorting to kitchen politics let me got put it that it. way it makes no sense it's a waste of time yeah, got it so whenever there's a need to oppose anything that especially when it comes from the the right wing spectrum of the ideological divide you know the response is that it's fascism <laughs> right i mean you you hear that very often and mm -hmm. but fascism is a very grotesque ideal that involved the the killing willful mm -hmm. persecution of 6 million people right mm -hmm. but the moment such labels are imposed uh, with absolutely no basis whatsoever then the nuance that's required in such debates completely gets thrown out of the window how do we address this hijacking of nuance from complex issues uh, because unless and until we we address those nuances you know through a a a, a civilized debate we not going to find any common ground or we not going to come at solutions and right. and the society will continue to remain deeply polarized right so how how do we kind of tackle this so one i have consciously and in let's say in the interest of posterity stayed away from the word right wing hmm. i will never ever subscribe to that word at all okay. because it has acquired such negative connotation the world over that anybody who ident identifies it with that particular ideology is immediately appropriating or inheriting that nasty legacy true i don't think you should mm -hmm. and bharat under no circumstances should be doing it because the left and the right are certain uh, divides that we don't subscribe to and what is left in bharat and what is right in bharat frankly speaking is nowhere yeah, consistent with what is outside abs absolutely. okay so yeah, they often say that even from a political perspective it's neither india does not even have an economic right absolutely right? I mean, maybe today we can today, say yeah, that but i years. let's see where that goes but for all practical purposes 
at best the left is clear that it is the left True. i think the non left should call itself the non left absolutely and the ones who truly believe that there is an indic wing must call themselves that members of the indic wing i don't know if i subscribe to the concept of a wing because mine is an issue based approach i would simply put faith in the notion that i am neither left nor right as swami ji said my considered position has been that i believe that my allegiance is to the indic thought and the indic civilization consciousness whoever supports it in whichever issue will obviously have my support so that's one now coming to the question of uh how do we conduct this discourse without acrimony and with some sense of thing the unfortunate part is the levels of honesty in public discourse have significantly gone down okay so as long as there is no honesty in that particular discussion and there is constantly a filter that is being imposed when you try to speak the truth no no this will hurt that sentiment this will hurt that sentiment are sentiments are bound to be hurt when someone says something yeah i take it on your chin be an adult someone says something that you don't like have the guts to listen to it I think that's the first thing that you should learn if you are a member of the so-called Indic wing or the Dharmic wing. So that's one. Second, uh, there is an attempt on the part of anyone who comes to limelight to take a centrist position. They may have taken a certain position before they came to limelight, but and the moment they come to limelight, the, there is a centrist position because acceptability gets because you're trying to look for acceptability. Absolutely. But the surprising part is you reached here without acceptability. Why are you fighting for acceptability beyond this? You don't need to fight for acceptance. I would suggest that you fight for what you believe is right, and stick to the rule of law, stick to the four corners of the constitution, and stick to the policy that you believe in. If you have come here despite others, not because of others, why do you consider? Why do you, why do you think it's important for you to constantly reach out to them? If you reach a certain position, which is a constitutional office or an elected office, I certainly believe that you have a duty to reach out to everyone, because you're obviously not the prime minister or let's say the president of a particular section. Okay, there I have no two ways about it. But in terms of policy, if you believe in something and that is the policy for which you were voted for, then fo follow it up, back yourself, and see it through. That's one. In terms of let's say public discourse, it's become extremely difficult to identify what portal or what source or what information to rely upon. Got that's the tragedy I think of. Explosion of information, true, and that's not just something that's limited to Bharat. It, it's everywhere. Mm. So we will go through this particular churn. Maybe after a point, we will realize it makes no sense to read so much from different sources. You must read a few credible sources and apply your own individual original mind to it. I think now there is a lot of information. There is a lot of let's say patanam as opposed to adhyayanam. That is the distinction. Okay. Okay. So there it's is. It's almost like information versus insight. Insight. I don't see how much of it do we actually absorb. How how much of it we actually critique. I would say that I'm not someone who reads a lot. Okay. Whatever I read, you go deep. At least I manage to try and internalize it, agree with it and disagree with it. I know what I'm talking about to some extent. And I'm not saying this about me. I'm generally saying that I think perhaps we should move in that particular direction. because uh, too much of information according to me sometimes you don't know whether it is necessary or not in the first place what are you going to do with all that information mm -hmm. that's one three i think is uh, our education system seems to be dumbing down people perhaps the education system has been structured in such a way mm -hmm. that it does not allow people's originality to come forth okay where there is always a call to authority he said this so believe it she said this therefore believe it so it's an attribution culture so to speak that's how i think we are going about it okay. and maybe the the need to generate individual original thought an incisive insight that i think is missing yes, if you can address education mm -hmm. and if you take education seriously from the standpoint of history to the standpoint of or let's say to the perspective of pedagogy also from teaching methodology to the content of what is being taught and the production of knowledge there is a significant chance that you may address this issue if not in the next 5 years at least in the next 15 years okay but we are constantly interested in, in addressing only the present i don't think that's going to work anything that you do has to be to address the future because the present i think is moving at such a pace that you're trying to keep pace with the treadmill whose pace is constantly increasing increase okay yeah. so perhaps your chances are better if you were to invest in the future and always investment in the future means investment in education, education. In the next generation maybe if you do that you will produce people who know what to ignore who know what to focus on who know what matters that filter needs to come out as long as that filter doesn't come out you'll constantly talk at cross purposes and social media for all practical purposes become dustbin okay absolute trash mm -hmm. 
most platforms, I'm sorry to say, not the existence of the platform, but the manner in which we choose to use the platform. True, true. It all goes back to what is the filter that you've grown. Got it. So, so that comes to me, that brings me to the next question. You know, the power of social media over government and the implications for uh, you know a society. Because we we see, I mean, that was a point in time where. Uh, corporations used to be, you know, controlling governments, right? And we've right. seen that in some of the Latin American countries, and we've right. also seen that even even in evolved democracies like the U.S. to some correct, extent, correct, so on and so forth. Correct. Uh, but I mean, those were uh, industrial complexes, right? Correct. Some were military industrial complexes and other forms of industrial complexes. Correct. But now it seems to be taking a completely different turn and flavor, right? I mean, it's, these are these are tech companies with with high computing capabilities, and they have very powerful algorithms that can right, hook right. people. Uh, so. This and 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 in in this crossfire between the between the state, which itself is a powerful entity, and social media enterprises, you know, which which have uh, in disproportionate control over the way people think and you know so many other aspects. Where do where do, where does a common man find uh, you know uh, his 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 spot of of being safe and you know and, and not being manipulated or not being coerced into something that he would otherwise not do? Under the nation state system which is the product of the Westphalian civilization, the common man never stood a chance. If you see how this particular system has evolved, when European principalities broke away from the Catholic Church and the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, and decided to colonize people, when you need to colonize, what do you need? Money. Because colonization means war, means resources. So who will you go to? The wealthy aristocrat Absolutely. and the, the money bags. The Rothschilds. So, of the therefore, na nation state engendered the rise of capitalism, which saw a fair degree of coincidence of interests mm. between people in power and people with money. Okay. Military industrial complex is not a spin off or an aberration of the nation state system, it's a logical corollary and sequitur of the nation state okay. system. Okay. It's a product. It's a product. Okay. And there is enough literature and there is enough evidence to back this. Okay. okay. Now the only thing is, the man who used to be the sword, sword believed that he always had the upper hand. Sure. Now the t t tables have turned a no. bit. Got it. Because now you have, uh, you have realized that private players perhaps wield more power. True. And maybe they are responsible for even bringing you to power. True. True. Okay. True. Considering True. that. Absolutely. Considering that, from the military industrial complex, it has become the media military industrial complex. I call it the MMIC. Okay. I said this even in a previous uh, uh, podcast of sorts that this is the issue and I have written about this I think on the 5th of February in the Daily Guardian I wrote and yesterday we had this discussion on the draft rules for social media that the government has proposed. Got it. I believe that whether it's a nation state or a civilization state, the state must insist and enforce and assert its primacy because the common man's fortunes cannot be left to private destinies Absolutely. or the common man's destinies cannot be left to private hands. Mm -hmm. We have elected the state, not the private, private entity. Entities. Got it. We have put faith in the state, not the private entity. Our social contract is with the state, not the private entity. Got it. Private entities can generate wealth, but public policy must come from the state. state. Got it. And therefore, it's for the state to ask itself, how much of space is it willing to cede to private parties? And especially parties who have the power to deal with consciousness, mind space, AI. That is the next big tech. And we're looking at AI mostly from the standpoint of how many jobs will we lose, what kind of state. revolution will come. So you're and looking at from a very has to be developed. exactly. So very you're not looking at it from the point of occupation of the consciousness or the mind space. And imagine people who speak of consciousness and spirituality, the civilization is looking at AI from the perspective of utilitarianism as opposed to seeing what is the impact of AI on the mind, mind. and human consciousness. So I think uh, I've said this before as a suggestion that the government must set up a task force for emerging technologies. Primarily from the standpoint of looking at it in the long run. Mm -hmm. What does it do 30 years down the line? If banning of a TikTok can lead in stupid uh, reactions, people committing suicides, mm -hmm. people coming out with videos crying saying that oh, TikTok has been banned, imagine the kind of addictive control that that particular app wielded. True. So it is not beyond the pale of reasonableness or uh, imagination anymore to say that a certain technology that has a certain addictive control it's on, on you is yeah. already there it already exists True. how else do you explain video games how else do you explain people getting addicted to PUBG or whatever it is mm -hmm. okay but there was about blue whale something True. True. right True. all of this ultimately this is you have the proof it's not something that is waiting to happen it has already happened so therefore 
the state must step up because it is the state which has the power to amplify public morality and public policy. That is the multiplier effect and the megaphone effect that the state is in a unique position to deliver. I think they should step up to it. From, I mean, just just you know, looking at what you said from the vantage of economics, it's almost like these private entities create an externality which is not in the interest of the society. Correct. That is where this nation steps in and you know keeps them under. Check. Correct. Correct. We're running short of time, but I have one last question, and probably I'll have uh, you know you know you sharing your quick thoughts on this. Yeah. The power of a few well-funded and well-connected protesters over the vast silent majority to the extent that they can hold the government to ransom. Uh, right. Yeah, your views on that. Uh, I am never going to run down the concept of a few people having the ability to ventilate their grievance. Because assume for a moment that a brute majority government comes from the opposite direction mm -hmm. and decides to say that this country belongs to illegal migrants. True. What do we do then? We must have the power to, to at least to, to, respond to, to and push back. Absolutely. Right? Now, therefore, as opposed to mechanisms, the question is the government should cut off the source in terms of money. Where does it come from? Come from. Uh, I believe that despite FCRA regulations being tightened, this year we were looking at 29,000 crores. Hmm. If this is the figure after tightening of the screws, Imagine what it would have been I don't know what would have happened between 1998 or other 2004 to 2014. Got that it. was a lost decade and that was a decade where a lot of things were facilitated for multiple reasons. Sure. So what is the figure that we are looking at? Mm -hmm. So external influence on domestic politics, the government must step in. Mm. Two, anyone who operates in the space of let's say the NGO, especially in the field of uh, let's say uh, medicine health, public policy, Education. must be subjected to strict standards. Mm. You wish to be a non-governmental organization, which means the government must look out, look at you as a certain partner. In implementation or something. In like implementation, that's, right. that's your expectation. Yeah. Then you might as well satisfy certain basic annuals and you might as well pass must on basic annuals. So that according to me is something that the government must do. Mm. There is no point in running down the concept of an NGO. Make it stricter, make it tighter. But most importantly, the rest of the society must not leave this job to the government altogether. You must have your own societal institutional responses when you see that certain private non-governmental players are intent on destroying the social fabric or the civilizational fabric, let me put it bluntly, of this particular country, then you must step up. If there is a movement, there must always be the ability to launch a counter movement without hoping that the government will always do the job because the government is always going to be under multiple pressures and pressures. multiple pulls yes. and tugs. Yes. You don't expect the government to always respond. Even if it does, its pace is going to be slow. Absolutely. Much slower than the people who are actually making it Correct. Respond. Correct. Okay. The pace of the problem is always going to be faster than the pace of the solution. Absolutely. Saidipak, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure, pleasure. talking thank to you. you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights, and I'm sure this would have, you know, provoked a lot of thoughts in the minds of the, you know, hundreds of listeners that we, I mean, hundreds of viewers, you know, who actually tuned in. Uh, and a big thank you from the entire Chinmaya Mission family. So I'd like to thank Chinmaya Mission for giving me an opportunity and for your immense patience and for the kind of questions that have been put and for patiently subjecting yourself to my drone attack. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was fun. Thank you so much for that. So thank you very much everyone, uh, you can please subscribe to this channel and in the link below uh, you could uh, have more information about the future talks that is being organized as part of the Chinmay UAV series. Uh, thank you very much for being with us this evening, uh, it was wonderful having you all. Hariyo.